Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're just about to enter the third and uh, final panel session for the Independent Yoga Network, The Future of Yoga. This panel session will deal with something very close to my heart, and that's concerns for yoga. Um, so let's crack on. And I'd like to introduce Giza Temchak from the European Union of Yoga, who will be discussing yoga past, present, and future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So welcome to this <coughs> sec a session which is prepared <coughs> again on the behalf of the European Union of Yoga. But not all the views are just institutional, there are some personal views on next. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, if you come back. Later. You see, this is the present situation as uh, we can see that there's a lot of declaration of love, but a lot of ego, you see. If you can't do the handstand, you are not really a good yoga teach. If, if you're not young enough, it's not so good. So the next slide, please. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we have already heard that there is so much change. <clears throat> uh, you see the huge uh, political issues. You see Comey speaking about the um, extra body experience when we was relating to President Trump. He already did a declaration. He felt like being outside his body. If he is having outside the body experience, then what about us? We should have it. Now, <clears throat> the uh, changing value system. Uh, you know, when we speak about what is yoga about, we have already heard that there's so many views. And all the views tend to change. Change with experience, with time. Um, I heard that uh, the Independent Yoga Network has elders. Every one of you will become elder sooner or later. So the value system will change. Then um, what you give importance to that also changes. The materials aspects, the body seem to be the number one, even though behind it the non-material values are hidden. Then various uh, non-optimal frames uh, which we are getting attached to. So uh, what do we identify with? This is also a problem. Because <clears throat> if you identify yourself with the concept that you should be always and eternally a young, like Krishna, and never die, Sooner or later, there will be a problem. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you have a mir mirror at home. So <clears throat> there is enormous influence of the media. So um, nowadays it was mentioned that the internet is connecting us, but internet is also connecting us to various views which uh, <clears throat> uh, influence us, you know. Sometimes we are influenced not even knowing that we are. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> uh, it was already told that 50 years ago, if you mentioned yoga, oh, it was a bad, weird thing. You, sometimes people thought that you are uh, coming from a sect. Nowadays, yoga became a little bit toothless because um, the general view of yoga, I mean a general view, not your view, because we represent a minute um, sample of humanity. And so um, we accept a sort of toothless yoga, uh, which means that we leave out a lot of steps from practicing or comprehending yoga. And uh, it is good for the start. You know, if you have a just fresh ground, nature puts them, uh, there are some uh, plants which actually gradually change the quality of the of the ground of the <coughs> of uh, the substance and which then the next step another set of plants can grow so when we see that oh so many asanas we like them of course but some people think that asanas are all once we had a course in taiwan and we were trying to <coughs> um, 
present the yoga as we understand them. And after one hour, one lady raises a hand that, please, it's very nice, but when shall we do some yoga? And so I ask, okay, but what do you mean by yoga? Well, asanas, hatha. But even if you mention hatha, you are doing mis injustice to hatha yoga because hatha yoga starts with chat karmas, yes, but ends with satana, end with samadhi, even though it is said that it is a preparation for the Raja Yoga. But even the Raja Yoga, you have problems because <coughs> we had a big conference somewhere in Scotland and <coughs> a young man came and said, anyone interested in, in Ashtanga Yoga, please, next morning, seven o'clock, we start then. I went there. And for one and a half hour, we just touch this vinyasa, and at the end I ask, okay, but where is the rest, the seven angas? What is it? I tried to explain. My master never said about it anything, so I don't know. So we accepted that Ashtanga can, can be one anga, so it's a little bit toothless. But <clears throat> uh, nowadays we have the wellness, yoga, fitness, we already heard about it a lot, <clears throat> but um, um, the main problem is that uh, the original model of yoga was not business oriented. And so <clears throat> in some areas we still have yoga offered on the basis of a seva or a service to the society. <clears throat> and uh, so next slide please. <clears throat> this is the way how we can <clears throat> really connect to people because then they come and get it without uh, financial burden. But then another person told me, look, don't do this, because then people think it has no value. Mm -hmm. I saw that basic course costing 7,000 euros <coughs> is flooded with people. If you offer the same for 100, hmm, not good enough. So strange. Um, then <coughs> every day, uh, in Rishikesh, uh, at the ashram where I happen to be, it was a sort of daily uh, way of getting amused. The people going to their city, they had the task to find a new yoga which they have never heard about. And it was no day that they didn't come and tell, look, this is, this is the new yoga which we have just discovered. This is the leaflet they are distributing between the people. So, so what is new yoga? Can it be different to the so-called old yoga. I think it, if it's not linked to it, then it is not really a yoga. And we know that diversity is there, because in nature we always have diversity. But <clears throat> uh, the other problem linked to this is that uh, the yoga teacher training is also getting a very interesting dimension that <clears throat> like people learning how to play an instrument, they look at the YouTube, fish out the appropriate um, movies, videos, and they start learning. That's fine. But if you look at various, I mean, hundreds of thousands of, of yoga programs, and you, after watching it for a week, declare yourself to be a teacher, that means you offer some courses, nobody objects. But uh, there will be some possible um, unfortunate happenings to the people who are being guide, guided by uh, not really well qualified uh, people who call themselves a teacher. So <clears throat> um, there is a public demand and a very great public demand for yoga teachers and people who have never heard about uh, the intricacies of yoga, they took the first course uh, which is offered in their area or n next to their uh, place where they live. So the next slide, please. So, <clears throat> you know, this is one of the Czech top asana people. So the symbol is flexibility, use, nice haircut. <laughs> <laughs> the C at the back, so Bali, perhaps this is the mecca of um, yoga nowadays. You know, you can see Barack Obama practicing just in my class, you know. So <clears throat> these are the present day preferences. And uh, <clears throat> uh, if they are not offered other things, or even if they are offered, they think, yes, this is how I would like to look like. So 
but again, it doesn't last forever, as you already said. So next slide, please. So sometimes we get into the condition that, okay, we are here, but where is the airplane? What next? So how to take the trip on? So, <clears throat> so with this, <clears throat> I come to the European Union of Yoga. You may know that it was established in 1971. And uh, one of its key assets is the teacher training program because uh, we feel that uh, uh, this is the key because you identify to a certain degree with your teacher, you follow whatever he or she is telling you, teaching you. Uh, in fact, the teacher is the resource book of anyone who is practicing yoga, in spite of the fact that the bookstores are full of um, books on yoga, the internet is uh, full of, <coughs> of yoga uh, videos, but still, a person is needed. You know, Elon Musk is now declaring and bringing uh, string away for his full automation, saying, oh, we discarded the, the, disregarded the people, uh, and so we have to uh, re-establish our prefer preferences towards uh, the manufacture of the most advanced cars. So people are needed, and qualified people are needed, even in yoga. So uh, we have this four-year minimum, minimum 500 years of program, which is, uh, for some, it is sort of thrown in the eyes. Four years. Yes, four years. Uh, if you compare to the classical Indian way, 12 years. Who would join a course when you would say, OK, so after 12 years, you are ready. Said, no, no, no. I, I, I have only two weeks. <laughs> what to do? <laughs> Then <clears throat> next slide, please. So, um, yes, the problem is <clears throat> that, as it was mentioned, the yoga industry or the wellness industry needs yoga teachers who know, know it is enough if they know only the basic things, asanas, relaxation, perhaps a little bit of, of pranayama, but that's optional. But people like to relax and people like to do asanas. <clears throat> so uh, for them, four years, mm -mm, too long. We need shorter courses, otherwise we do not have enough teachers for our programs. Now this, this is something which uh, <clears throat> pops up even if uh, in our faraway country, because you may know that I come from Slovakia, even though I'm a Hungarian, a Hungarian, I didn't travel anywhere. The borders used to travel during <laughs> war times. So <clears throat> even, even in my faraway country, uh, we have this problem that <clears throat> those people who <laughs> are not really successful in our four-year program, they go to the wellness uh, industry and they do quite well. Uh, so no injuries I heard about. So. Other thing is that uh, the yoga studio is a concept because in Europe we have this concept that uh, there is always an umbrella institution which either gives you a training system and it trains you, <coughs> then um, you have an association which in fact if it accepts you then it guarantees a certain quality of your um, teaching. Now. <coughs> uh, the strategy of yoga studios is quite different. It's more, more or less an American model, a US model, that you are a self-sustained system and you refer only to yourself as an authority, even though um, there is this yoga alliance, which is a sort of inverted commas, uh, authority, but there is revolts even against this because it has its weak points, but we know that. So, <clears throat> um, in spite of the um, ideological differences between uh, various schools, uh, I don't say schools of yoga, but schools which advocate yoga, <clears throat> yoga is really um, taking over the uh, general population. There is a sort of um, unverified number that about 350 million people do yoga worldwide, which is a huge number. I mean, really, yoga does very well. 
and uh, because the yoga extended to the prisons, you know, prisons are in a way the ideal um, place for yoga. You don't have to care, you are given food. Um, if you're in solitude, so not with roommates, you can meditate as much as you want if you take to this path. But I'm not advocating that you enter the prison. It's easier to do it outside. One minute. One minute, please. Very good. So the next slide, please. <coughs> uh, look, this is our prime minister. What you see, oh, he is having a karmic problem, writes the newspaper. Next slide. Uh, one, click one more, please. This is Edmonton. Take up your best position. What is it? Padmasan. Well, well, or Kukutasan. I don't see really properly. So, yoga is a part of our culture. And so, I think there is no need to worry about uh, <laughs> whether yoga will survive or not. It is surviving now. It will survive. And so, the future is bright, even if we have a catastrophe, because the yoga people will survive with a smaller damage because inside they will have a center to which they can relate the events which may be unfortunate, difficult, but make it, so to say, easier to integrate and uh, be the seed for the next generation, not only of yogis, but the people who perhaps would create a better um, civilization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giza. Uh, I'd now like to introduce, if I put my glasses on, Summer Fabian from Aurolab Yoga and an IYN Younger. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I don't want to go to, 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 oh, to go into doom. Uh, but some of the, the things I'm going to attempt to put forward are slightly concerning. And although I agree with my friend here that uh, yoga will survive and, of course, take us forward, but I think uh, only if we stay extremely vigilant, extremely vigilant. I've called my presentation today, which I'm going to read because it's an article that I've written, uh, The Uberization of Yoga. Um, and we all know the story about uh, Uber. Uh, you might have heard that uh, um, they are a taxi kind of, they're an application. And this is what, what we need to, to understand very well. Um, my concerns about yoga online, which are kind, kind of flooding, the whole place is flooded with yoga online, and I'd like to reflect on this at the moment. So uh, the tagline that I've used here is, uh, in using yoga applications, are we actively participating in the, in the automatization of the human body, or is this part of the democratization of yoga and its accessibility to all? By asking these questions, I would like to introduce a reflection on the practice of yoga from online applications. Not so much to polarize our view, whether it's good or bad, uh, but rather to offer some facts and subjects of reflection. There is an economical and political aspect of this, and then I question the medium of the digi digital screen, which I'm the only one to use today, I have to say, <laughs> itself, and its effect on the nervous system, and the philosophical questions that this generates. Um, what's interesting in the, app, in, 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 these things are quite complex, so I hope you've done all your digestive uh, <laughs> things, all your digestion. Um, what we have to retain, and this is what I've put on the first slide, is that the value and the profit are no longer in the service provided, but in the interface between the consumer and the supplier. It's the application where the value and, incidentally, the money goes. So this is uh, something to keep in mind while we go to the second slide. 
So you might ask, all, what has all this to do with yoga? The proliferation of online yoga over the past few years has followed the logic of the market, targeted advertising and competitive posturing. We hear that you can do, we can do yoga anywhere, that we don't have to worry about cool outfits, expensive studio fees, big classes, annoying teachers, the state of our hair or the smell of our breath. So this is how it's sold on the internet. We are supported in being the center of our own universe, unquestioning the new forms of oppression distilled by the technological superpowers, which these days are called GAFA, standing for Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. The matrix on which these applications depend, and that will make use of anything that it can find a market for, especially your personal data. It so happens that yoga, as uh, my friend here was saying, is in great demand in these times of uncertainty and despair, for there is a lot of despair out there. All manner of spiritual practices are sold on the internet. Previously, hermetic teachings are made available to all. Yogis and thinkers of all kinds are bringing value to these applications, mostly in good faith, but I suspect utterly unaware of the economic and ideological consequences they are participating in propagating. It matters no longer what the content might be. Anything goes, really. Even the most radical ideas can be appropriated. What matters now is the framework within which these ideas are delivered. As teachers, as I say in the slide here, we produce value with our experience and knowledge at teaching. In these applications, we become a consumer's star-rated pro product, because in some of these applications, you see the, the face of the teacher and that star rated. Incidentally, Shivaria has got 2.5 stars out of five. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and this is more worrying. Listen to the words of this. In a recent article in the New York Times, uh, we read, what's liberating about online yoga is the variety. Classes range from 10 to 90 minutes, and if you tire of one teacher or style of yoga, you can switch to another with a click of a mouse or the swipe of a finger. Convenience is the key word. Next, please. So here are our lovely teachers. By all means, wonderful teachers, lovely teachers, all presented, and it's the presentation that is very, the design is very important these days. The pre those of you who are photographers, filmmakers, artists, will understand what we're being sold here. You're being sold happy, fit, and on top of their games, uh, yogis. Uh, in this particular application, 455 <laughs> teachers presented as a product of consumption. And I will develop this uh, more. A different application, same presentation. Uh, next slide. Different application, same presentation. Um, so we are told yoga anytime, anywhere. Through the, but what's important to, to keep in mind is what screens do to us. In terms of the yoga practice, yoga anytime, anywhere, through the mediums of screens, has the potential to destroy temporality, the dance of intermittence the alternating rhythms of life, time to work, to play, to eat, to relax, to sleep and dream, to practice. It can also blur seasonal rhythms, all of which are essential for us to be able to act. And I will uh, develop this. The singularity of the human brain is that it can disorganize itself completely and then reorganize itself throughout in relation to its environment and the screens that it has invented, from cave paintings, as we heard earlier on in the uh, human development, human evolution, to digital tools. How does the current addi addiction to screens reorganizes the brain? And this I'm, I'm talking about the next generation of practitioners. And can it be toxic? What makes a brain human is that it is capable of experiencing revelation. Next. 
when we practice from a screen, we enter into a relationship with the screen. In front of a screen, we experience, and this I think is quite important, a reorientation of our desire for self-revelation towards the consumption of a new good, which is now the yoga teacher. The nature of a good is that it can only be consumed. The student only witnesses the teacher as on top form, smiling automaton, not as a changing human being, negotiating a bad cold, the death of a loved one, or breast surgery. The teacher becomes dehumanized. The teacher does not see, feel, or hear you. There is no body-to-body -body resonance. You are on your own, attempting to make sense of a highly refined and difficult technology, which is yoga, which requires a strong connection with our endosomatic capacity, our internal capacities, like attentiveness, focusing, breath awareness, the felt sense, out of which an intimacy with the self, a knowing evolves. And I, wish, I would like to contrast this knowing with information slash knowledge, which of course can be gathered exosomatically, externally. To transform impulse, as, it, as in on demand, into desire, which requires an investment of time, of resources, of love, we need education. This is a, pro a process of apprenticeship, which takes time. According to human development urologists, this process takes anything from 12 to 20 years. What we see now with cultural and, and uh, service industries is the destruction of these educational processes because they are replacing social relationships which demand an adaptation. And this is very important, how to adapt. This demands an adaptation. And uh, those processes of adapta adaptation ad are required. In yogic education, the transformation goes further still. Desire is transmuted into aspiration, inspiration, a new breath, an expansion of the practitioner's field of experience, a new way of being in the world. And Patanjali reminds us that this is brought about by diligent practice in the spirit of non-attachment and over a long period of time. Meanwhile, in the US, recently trained yoga teachers have reported experiencing cultural pressure from the people who pay for their classes. People don't want to learn. They expect to get what they want and have paid for as fast as possible. This is the reign of the consumer's mind. And as Bernard Stiegler says, slowly, we are losing the taste for the effort to learn inside the adipose tissues of the net. We rest in the reassuring comfort of instantaneous knowledge. All is drastically simplified. It is the pampering of the human spirit. Next, please. The very language that is used in, in these applications is quite revelatory of the mind, the mindset behind them. In a recent article, we are told, a notable issue for new yogis is the selection of a teacher. Whatever happened of the sense of the teacher crossing our path when we are ready to receive the teachings, which has more to do with the psycho-spiritual alignment than the click of a button. And it proceeds to guide you, literally, to tell you how to uh, actually choose a teacher, how to select the teacher. And here, this is where we have to be very uh, attentive. The danger, the danger here is in the automatization of the decision-making process. We no longer rely on felt sense, intuition, our connection with the Vijnana Kosha, but on someone else's criteria. So how is this affecting our bodies in the longer term? Of course, I'm not suggesting to giving up the internet, as I'm myself using it quite a bit as a resource. But can the highly refined technology of yoga be reduced to simple information? Next, please. This refined technology of yoga, 
of the inner workings of the human being includes a set of subjective tools that can bring about singular experiences of clarity, integration, peace, wholeness. But Homo sapiens is not only a biological being, it is also a technological being. We create objective tools that brings, bring convenience and comfort to our lives. With the flooding of yoga applications on the internet, we are led to believe that yoga is part of this objective set of tools that bring comfort and convenience to our lives. This obviously misses the point and insidiously plays into the consumerist ideology, which, as we know, produces enormous amount of toxicity. One must observe carefully what our mindset is when we reach for the computer screen to get into our practice, and what is the difference when we sit or lay down with the intention of internalizing our attention, making ourselves receptive to the tides, the waves, the vibrations, the undulations, the beats, the rhythms of our nervous system, our fluid body, a mind register and translate as the inner life, the internal ecosystem of our embodied being. But we are told that we can do whatever we want, whenever we want, only concerned with fitting a busy, uh, uh, a kind of cool workout in the midst of our busy lives. Next, please. I'm going to skip this one because there's more important things that I'd like to say. So, number 10. I would like to just conclude to su suggesting that we need to question the ideology that is being fed to us, for it is toxic and can render us sterile. Let's not allow yoga practitioners and teachers to become technological sheep. We need to think. We might believe we think too much, while in truth what passes for thinking is often mere rehashing, repeating, memorizing, remembering, sorting out immediate needs, easing anxieties, and negotiating fears. Thinking is a creative effort. It is not a calculation. It is the ability to change direction, to shift. To think intelligently is to liberate ourselves from automatic responses, dictated often by the so-called free market, so that we may be able to create new models. So my question is to finish. As a community, are we up to the task of producing potent thoughts, thoughts that can generate powerful action and bring about the changes that are so sorely needed? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sama. Thank you. Um, next up, we've got Swami Ambikananda from the Traditional Yoga Association dealing with a rather interesting topic here, GMO, hybrid or fossil? Thank you. We'll try and get there. But I'm very aware that none of us would be here, and especially not me, if it was not for many, many generations of yogis who took the trouble to hand down this knowledge to the next generation. So I'd like to begin with the chant to the guru. Om Chaitanyam Shashvatan Shantam Vyomatitam Niranjanam Nada Bindu Kalatitam Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Om Shanti 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 The economist Galbraith tells a funny story about going up to a leading physicist of his day and saying to him, look, I wonder... Could you tell me exactly what is electricity? And this guy looked at him, screwed up his eyes, sucked in his breath, and said, 
it depends what you mean by is. So in my 20s, if somebody said to me, you know, um, when I just started out on my yoga journey, what is yoga? I think I would probably have said something like chitta vritti naroda, because even if it's not an answer, heck, it showed how erudite I was. Um, but I think now, if somebody came up to me and said, what is yoga? I would find myself screwing up my eyes, sucking in my breath and saying, it really depends what you mean by is. Um, <laughs> Yoga has evolved over thousands of years. We heard from the Swami that maybe yoga has been here since humans were here. Its first how-to manual that we still have is the Kato Upanishad, which is at least 5,000 years, if not older. Before that, we had the yoga teachings of the sage Vashishta to the young Prince Rama, and the teachings of uh, the avatar Krishna to his, young, to his warrior friend Arjuna. Much later came the teachings of Yagnavalkya and Patanjali, which themselves are over 2,000 years old. We have the medieval Nath texts that people have spoken about today, the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, the Gehan Samhita, and so on. You have Kashmiri Shaivite Yoga. You have my own favorite, Lingayat Yoga. It goes on and on. These yogas have evolved over all this time, um, and when we look at them, they give us a magnificent evolution of we humans reaching out for an understanding of the more that we are. We want to be open to that more. We glimpse it ever so briefly at the very edges of our consciousness. Um, but it's never quite within our grasp a more that is not just confined to our physical history or the bondage we have to a particular time and place. It's a more that will perhaps lead us to one thing that is the ultimate subject of all things. Dr. Yates once in an email to me described yoga as a grace, a benediction. And that's as good a description as any. Um, but it doesn't tell us what yoga is, um, because the is is the journey of yoga. It has to unfold. What yoga is has to unfold in each of us, just as it unfolded in human history. It, and this is my contention. It might be the perfect forward bend to a gym bunny, and that's fine. And it might be an in-depth study of scriptures to a monk like myself who has nothing better to do. Or it might be seeking that silence between breaths for the meditating yogin, or many other things in between that we can't even conceive of. And yet here we are in the 21st century in Britain, and there are those seeking to create a national occupational standard that by its very nature would force us to define what yoga is and therefore what it is not. And this is being done, all of this is being done in the name of public safety. And this is where it kind of reminds me of GMOs. So an organism like a plant, say, that's evolved over hundreds of thousands of years is broken down into its component parts and then engineered to be an ostensibly better thing. And companies like Monsanto tell us, we have to do this. This is how we will feed all the hungry people of the world. And we are good people. We want all those people to be fed. So we pause. And while we pause, they engineer. And then we find out it slowly emerges that the seeds they are producing and that the farmer now has to buy are resistant to the weed killers that they can supply. And what is more, they've bought up all the seed companies already. So the farmer has to go to them for the seeds. 
And the farmer has to go to them again and again because the seeds they produce are sterile. They don't produce other seeds for the next season. And was it worth it? Are all the people being fed? Apparently not. Because what is emerging is that the businesses that we handed over to these companies made a promise they couldn't keep. Um, it turns out that their crops yield no better and in some cases much worse um, than naturally farmed crops. And we came to that knowledge late in the game. Now Monsanto and a few corporates own most of the farming production and their engineered seeds are rapidly infecting our own and so here we are tied to them. And now that is my contention is what we want to do to yoga. We want to define it because you have to, to create an NOS. And you want to say, this is yoga, and only the people doing this are actually doing yoga. If you go to those others, you go to them at your peril. And so slowly, the yoga teacher, who has perhaps been teaching in the church hall for 25 years, or the guy who's opened his own yoga studio, both people who have allowed yoga to evolve them and who have evolved themselves with yoga now have to conform to something else. Mm -hmm. And they have to do it because the noise those that control this will create through the media will say, go to the others at your peril. Um, and so there you will have it, Monsanto Yoga. <laughs> and but I want to say, I don't hold with the fossilizing of yoga either. Yoga is undoubtedly part of the Hindu religion. It's one of our six base, basic theologies. Not uh, that this is acknowledged by those seeking to create the NOS. I've been to the meetings. Um, they have to fight this point that yoga is part of a religion because not since the Reformation has religion been legislated in this country. The British took to heart Queen Elizabeth's admonition that she would not create a window into men's souls, and we are free to choose to worship as we will until now. At a meeting discussing the NOS, called by Skills Active, when I introduced this notion, it was so alien to them this idea that yoga was a part of Hinduism, I was very firmly opposed. Um, and somebody boldly said there was no India then. I said, um, actually, I think, you know, there's been an India since two supercontinents collided with each other and peopled by the people that left Africa. Um, and they said, ah, oh, now they thought they had me. It didn't exist as a political entity. Maybe not, but there were people there. They practiced a certain faith that we know as the Sanatana Dharma or Hinduism. Um, and yoga ev evolved within that, and it became the mystical branch of Hinduism. We can only deny that because we want to take control of it. That would be the only reason. Am I saying that you have to be a Hindu to practice or teach yoga? Absolutely not. Um, by its very nature, as with most mystical traditions, yoga is inclusive. Swami Shivananda used to say, um, whatever religion you are, you should practice yoga. It'll make you better at your own religion. Um, fossilizing yoga would mean that we ever only teach what has been taught. We, we heard Giza talk about the student who said, I can't teach anything else. I can only teach this because that's what my teacher taught. Um, and then we wouldn't evolve with great teachers that are evolving yoga now, like Swami Shivananda, like Sri Krishnamacharya, who brought exciting new stuff to it. And so I am asking to let your goodness act, can we show respect for yoga's origins? Can we show respect for the over billion people on our planet now for whom yoga is still part of their religion and not legislate what their religious practices should be? 
I'm really asking you to take this away with yourselves and say, is this what we want for yoga? Um, one of the things that saddened me at this meeting, these meetings was the kind of loss of yoga. We all know yoga means um, to, comes from the Sanskrit you, root yuj, which means to join. And when I was at the um, Zenal European meeting, beautiful village in the Alps and yogins from different schools took it over for a week. It was fantastic. And nobody was divisive. People were talking to each other and exchanging information with each other. And the same with the World Yoga Festival on the banks of the Thames. I'd advise everybody go. Yogins get together, talk to each other, and it's fantastic. Yoga does mean that kind of togetherness. And yet the minute we create an NOS, we're going to create an us and them. It is going to be a divisive tool that breaks that, N that togetherness. And I live like you in the age of the hungry lawyers. Um, so I know yoga teachers might need some protection and the public might even need some protection. So I proposed, if we're going to have to have an NOS, I'd rather we didn't, but could we just say, if this is for public safety's sake, could we have this? That the standard should seek to ensure that teachers have sufficient knowledge and understanding of physiology and the dynamics of movement to ensure practitioner safety. But it should add that this standard respecting yoga's religious origins will seek not to create a standard for the teaching of religious, spiritual, or philosophical aspects of yoga, that those will be left to each lineage and each school. That has to satisfy the health and safety needs. Um, and so really, that's what I'm asking of you as we leave this conference. What is it you want for the future of yoga? Do you want the Monsanto yoga? Do you want the fossilized yoga? Or do you want yoga to keep being what it has always been? A mystical path that if the scientists want to come and investigate it, they welcome. A mystical path that has always offered us a way of discovery of that more that we suspect we are. Hari Om Tatsat. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Satish Sharma, who is from the National Council of Hindu Temples. Um, and I'm looking forward to this especially as it's about yoga and activism. Thank you, Satish. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd just like to share with you first that this is my first outing in this scarf. It's a a brand new scarf gifted to me on the banks of uh, the Ganges in Rishikesh just last month. I was planning to just wear my outrageous sweatshirt, but uh, I have a restriction that I must wear this when I'm speaking on behalf of the Temples Council and indeed on behalf of the lineage. Bearing in mind that um, I sound like a Londoner, I just wanted to say how absolutely delighted I am to be here in the Midlands. I grew up in the East Midlands and um, Whenever I go to India, it takes about 10, 15 minutes until somebody comes up to me, says something outrageous, and then suddenly I'm home. And when I came here today, Pete spoke to me, and I heard Pete speaking, and I thought, great, I'm home. I'm back in the East Midlands where they say it like it is. So I'm hoping to, to keep a little bit of that in, in, in what I'm going to talk and how I'm going to say it. Before we start, if I could just ask you to, as practitioners, just ask yourself, where is the place that you hear the Aum when you say it silently? And for a moment, if you could just close your eyes, ask yourself that question, and connect with that location and that place. I just want to start with a, a mantra that I would use in our tradition. Om Akhanda Mandalakaram Vyaptam Yen Characharam Tadpadam Darshitam Yen Tasme Shri Guru Venama Oh, that's it. For those of you who've been practicing for a while, you'll know that that's the place where we're all one. At that place where you ask, 
where do, where do I hear the silent orm? Everything is left behind the moment you connect with that place. So I thought that would be a great place to, to start. Before I um, launch in, um, please feel free not to believe a word that I say. I often say this because that then gives me the freedom to say absolutely whatever I want. <laughs> and then if you do choose to take umbrage, it's your fault, not mine. <laughs> so um, so at th this time we're at a, a particularly dangerous stage in that we've been well fed and we run the risk of doing the yoga conference thing where a certain pink and fluffy niceness creeps into how we smile at each other and how we engage with each other. Our brain switches off and we go into that la-la land of just being nice and comfortable. But we all know that yoga only occurs, yoga experience and yoga evolution, yoga development and growth only occurs in that space of survivable discomfort. And so I'm going to do my best to gently take you into a space of a, a little discomfort. The, the subject of what I want to talk about was the tension between the inward journey and the outward journey. And the desire for tranquility and complete stillness. And its competition with the desire for engagement in a world which is increasingly challenging and is causing us to, to say, what are we going to do about this? There is a tension between the two. And sometimes that tension seems to be irreconcilable. It's become clear to me over the journey of the NOI, NOS and people's reactions to it that many people felt deeply troubled and outraged at who are these people disturbing my tranquility? Who are these people requiring me to move off my mat and engage with such unpleasantness? Who are these people who are now causing the whole industry to, to, to reflect and, and reconsider? But I'd just like to toss in, I'm quite happy to use the word industry because I know the word Indus, which was a source of economic activity in India, is where that word comes from. So I, I'm quite happy with the yoga industry. <laughs> um, but um, so this notion of reconciling the inward and the outward is really key to the practice, practice of yoga. Now, I'm going to use our understanding of debts to perhaps talk about how we can reconcile and balance that. We have a, a teaching which says that every person, when you open your eyes at some point on this planet, you're in a body, you didn't create it, you're in a place, not of your creation. And yet, you embark on a journey of incredible discovery and incredible experiences. And so we say, okay, everybody who experiences that has a debt to repay. And the first debt is the debt to the body, because something, some mechanism, some system, some process has created this thing in which you find yourselves. So you need to repay that debt. And we do that by looking after other bodies or creating bodies ourselves and helping them to replicate and reproduce and... Uh, um, continue the traditions. The other debt that we have is the debt to the society, which allows us to form and allows us to interact and experience those. And the final debt is the debt to the outside world, the actual construct in which we, we navigate with these bodies. So those three debts are absolutely paramount for any person, whether you're a yoga practitioner or not. And so my contribution, which I'd like you to think about, is that in repaying those debts outside, you are also fulfilling your journey inwards. It's actually constructed in that way. But the manner in which you repay those debts, that's the heart of the, the, the problem. And without going inwards to a certain place, state, understanding, sense of tranquility, your engagement in the outside world is probably going to be as troublesome and more problematic than the people who are doing the worst imaginable things. The, the, the pathway to hell is paved with good intentions. And so we really have to stop and reflect and turn inwards before we then become activists or start to engage in the outside world. So we have a number of organizations working in this yoga space who haven't done that. And it's clear by their actions and their activities that the IYN is not one of those. Um, of course. Um, <laughs> The, just, I'd just like to, to make one observation about the IY. And somebody mentioned earlier, I think it was Pete, the notion of a hut, where we just need a nice, simple hut, somewhere where we can sit tranquilly and do our practices. But in that scripture, it also says, seek a hut in a kingdom where the king is actually supportive of that activity. So my question is, as yoga practitioners, what do you do when you can't find a kingdom? Or the kingdoms where that activity can be performed become fewer and further between. 
where the kings who are tasked with creating that environment, they are perhaps reneging in their obligation to do that. Without that, we can't have our huts. And this is also part of that tension of the outer and the inner. It's really, really tempting when you're beginning your yoga journey to get engaged in what I call la-la land. And that is the intoxication of physicality, the intoxication of mentality, the intoxication of emotionality. Is that a word? Mm -hmm. Emotionality? Mm -hmm. Damn, trademarked. <laughs> no, please, open source. But it's very, very, <laughs> it's very, very possible to become so intoxicated in that that you become imbalanced, but your journey to become connected actually stops, it pauses. And so there is this conflict again manifesting in that how do you recognize when that space happens? What's the cure for it? And how do you then transcend that la-la land? The importance of that, I don't think, can be, can be overemphasized. One of the issues which yoga practitioners, I think, in this time, need to deal with head-on is separating themselves from this intoxication. Well, we do have traditions which are built on intoxication, but you can afford intoxication in a kingdom where somebody else is looking after the, the boundaries and the borders and maintaining your security and safety. But in the absence of that, intoxication is, is, is a difficulty. So my question then is, what do you do, and how do you know that what you're doing is the right thing to do? And this is actually the question which was at the heart of the Yoga Vashisht, which you mentioned, the conversation between Crown Prince Rama and his uh, two gurus. But it's also at the heart of the Bhagavad Gita. It's that same question, Arjuna is saying, what do I do? And they are surrounded by the most challenging circumstances. In the Bhagavad Gita, we have a, a wonderful conclusion, and I think that's the, the essence of the message. When Arjuna has completed his intellectual quest. He has asked every question that he was going to ask. At the end of it all, he knows that he is spirit incarnate and that bodies appear on the surface of this world in the same way that lotus flowers appear on the surface of a lake, that bumblebees come and become intoxicated in those lotus flowers in the same way that souls become intoxicated in these bodies and they forget who they are. He knows all of this, but at the end of it all, he still says, Krishna, what do I do? Right? What do I do next? And this is something that's going to we are all going to encounter. The group of people in this place, I don't think you have any inkling of how important and how potentially powerful you are. I come from a tradition which was isolated for 5,000 years by a mountain range at one end, by oceans on all other sides. It was an area of the world where food was plentiful, the climate was unbelievably supportive, and so people didn't have to compete for sustenance, for food. Everything was naturally available. And in that space, we had the time to evolve and answer the deepest questions that plagued humanity. Filling one's stomach, stomachs and having a roof over one's head is a prerequisite for being able to participate. In this island, on this island at this time, we have a group of people who don't have the basic requirements um, uh, under threat. We have full stomachs. We have the opportunities to do this. And on top of that, you're engaged in spiritual practices. You're engaged in yoga sadhana, yoga bhyas. That diminishes. If you think of the percentages of the population here, we're talking about a very tiny group of people. But what hasn't been yet, hasn't, hasn't happened, is there is an infinite quantity of energy and power which is waiting to course through conduits so that it can make the changes that we need to, to make happen out there. That's the work that we have at hand. And what we have to do is to remove the, the obstacles to that work. I've heard mention of this thing called ego. Um, we have some really pithy statements in my tradition, one of which is yatha pinde tatha brahmande. Um, some of you may know what that is. I thought I'd toss that in there for a bit of authenticity. Um, <laughs> but it means, as in the body, so in creation. And that's a, an incredibly powerful statement. It allows us to look at the processes of the body and then identify those processes in the outside world. And in the journey of understanding what the processes of the body entail and how they function, we actually become fully aware of how the outside world functions. Our bodies become ill when our identity becomes small, becomes tight, it becomes fearful. 
And what happens then in the outside world is we reflect that and project that into the outside world. So again, we have to finish our journey of yoga practitioners. How do we do this? Well, I've got a, I'm really looking forward to uh, the, the next few years. We have a, a saying that um, Kalyug is the hardest time, but 100 years of sadhana in Kalyug is equivalent to 10,000 years of yoga practice in Satyug. So we're really lucky to be born in a time where, hey, we get the short sort of journey, but it's short and steep. And so this, this is really, uh, it, it's a realization which will release positivity and engagement with us. But we have to identify the right teacher and the right teaching. This is absolutely paramount. And if we have, um, in our tradition, we say there are, Sri Krishnaji said it in the Gita, I've created humanity in four flavors. And the right flavor needs to have the right teaching. If the wrong flavor is taught the wrong um, body of knowledge, then nothing progresses. In fact, things get significantly worse. Um, to give you an idea of that, once uh, I heard somebody make a remark earlier, so I jotted down a few things. Imagine an engineering student accidentally walking into a medical examination. Okay? So the first question says, define antibody. So being a, an engineering student, he writes, one who hates his body. <laughs> Artery, study of fine paintings. Not sure, it could be military. Bacteria, back door of a cafeteria. Coma, punctua uh, coma is punctuation mark. Gallbladder, bladder of a girl. Genes, blue denim. Labor pains, got hurt at work. Ultrasound, radical sound that is above human hearing capacity, such as one's wife's talk. Sorry, that, was, that sneaked in. I had a call from my wife at the time. And so on. But you can see the necessity for matching a person's position with the vocabulary and with the science and the stage and the level that he is at. We've enshrined this in what we call the Guru Shisha Parampara. And so the Guru's role, first and foremost, is to say, actually, I can't teach what this person needs because his inclinations are different. He should actually be working with somebody else. Or if you're fortunate, then you encounter a person who is fully aware of each of the four types of stereotypes or archetypes of a human being and can give the answers of the appropriate um, uh, response. But I had a last one, and I have to pop this one into here. Urology, the study of European people. But that was... Uh, <laughs> I apologise. Um, right, uh, just to, to wrap up. Yatha ichasi tatha kuru. That was the closing advice that Arjuna received from Sri Krishna. When one's identity starts to evaporate, when one's sense of individual uh, existence starts to dissipate, you become connected with the things that drive you deeply. And there are some people who cannot stand injustice. And there are others who are so compassionate that they will sacrifice their existence for somebody else. There are others who are intellectually unbelievably powerful but have no sense of wanting to protect anything. Each of these is our own essence. As your personality diminishes, you become more aware of something called swabhav. Is that one minute? Something called swabhav, which is your inner sentiments. That guides you to something called swadharam, which is your personal individual purpose. What is it that really rocks your boat? And the teaching says, abandon all thoughts and understanding. Do what really makes you expand and grow and contribute in that space without fear of what the consequences are going to be. And as a group of yoga practitioners in this country, which is immensely influential at this time, with the backgrounds and the European um, position in, uh, on this earth at this moment in time, you have a phenomenal contribution to make. It just requires each of us to step up. So Om Tat Sat, thank you for, the, uh, for listening. Thank you. Finally, for this session, we have, uh, I'll ask Godfrey Devereaux to rise up. Um, he is uh, IYN Younger, thank you, and is part of the Dynamic Yoga. Thank you. Does this microphone work? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, luckily, Pete didn't say what I'm going to talk about because I'm not really going to talk. Um, instead, I'm going to ask you a question, but I'm going to prepare it a little bit. 
I know a few of you, not, not very many, but basically I've, I've got no idea what any of you do in terms of your yoga practice. I don't have any idea what you believe. I don't have any idea what authority you rely on. But I imagine that it works for you. Um, and I'd like to narrow this all down a little bit to yoga posture practice, which I know is just a tiny little fragment of what yoga is, um, because I am at least aware of how, let's say, many options you have for approaching yoga on a mat. And every one of those options has people who are passionately committed to it, whose lives have been changed by it, who think that it's, what shall I say, the bee's knees, um, and yet they're all very different. I suspect there must be something that they have in common. And that's really my, my question goes there. What is it that's actually making you feel so good about what you do? And what, therefore, could be disposed of? So... My practice, I suspect, is very, very different from most of you. I don't do traditional yoga postures. Um, I do lots of things that other people don't do. I don't do the bandhas, I don't do mudras, I don't do pranayama. But it works for me. And I'm wondering, why does it work for me? Is it just me, or does it work for other people? Anyway, so my question also involves, is there, could there be, any reliable and verifiable authority for yoga posture practice? Given that everybody has a different opinion. Well, my practice works because of the bandhas, or my practice works because of the pranayama, or my practice works because of the mudra, or whatever. So that's my question. How does it work? Is there actually any reliable, verifiable authority that you can use to guide in your practice rather than me telling you what I think you should do or what I think you should believe or what I think would work for you because it's worked for me and, of course, it's worked for those students of mine that haven't abandoned me. Obviously, it didn't work for those many, 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 many more that I haven't seen. Uh, again, which would make me, at least if mathematics was important to me, suspect that, well, it obviously doesn't really work. Uh, but it works for me. So, what is it? Is there a reliable, verifiable authority or is it all just a matter of chance or self-deception? Think about it or not. That's up to you. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Godfrey, just before we move to questions. <laughs> um, do you have any kind of inkling the, the, as to what it could be? Yes, but I, I absolutely refuse to say what it is. <laughs> could you possibly just give us some kind of road map? Or, uh... Yeah, go to your mat. And what about your heart? <laughs> just go to your mat. <laughs> That's the road map. So it's all asana? Well, I don't even know what that means. Does it mean shtiram sukam... What, what's the rest of it? I don't know what it means. I to think you, I'm going to throw to it me. open to you. I don't do what you do, I'm sure. I don't do Pashimottanasana, I don't do Adamatsyandrasana, I don't do Shishasana, I don't do Sarvangasana. But I use a mat every day. <coughs> so go to your mat. Do it your way. Yeah. Wow.
I think you've all got lots of questions. <laughs> um, Godfrey, would then there be any place for activism or all this that we're talking about that we must bring out and do and become forced to be reckoned with and change the course? So if all we were to do was just to go to our mats and be, would there then be some meaning in doing and being activists and fighting for a cause or... Is that something that you think we'll also find when we go to our mats? I'm just curious, what do you think about the previous speaker who talked about Swadharma and activism and taking up a cause, if that feels like the pure cause to take up? Thank you. Yeah, go for it, but it's got nothing to do with what I was saying. It, I, I wasn't trying to um, suggest that this is yoga, this is what we should do. I was just throwing out a little question, but yes, if you, if you feel like being active in any way, you should definitely do it. The gentleman just over there. Hi. Um, I, I just wanted to respond to Godfrey's um, um, comments. That, that I've, I've got a lot of sympathy for what you're saying, uh, and uh, I've, you know I've been practicing for fifty plus years now, and I've come to the conclusion that if I get on my mat every day and take up some kind of embodied awareness of what I'm doing, then that's enough for me. But I've had to go through a journey to get there. And um, I'm, I suspect there's plenty of other people that have as well. So um, I think there's a certain disingenuousness to what you're saying to a group of people that, because I, you know, I'm, I've, I've witnessed what you've written in the past and how you've honoured the, the uh, people that have taught you in the past and, and how you've followed their practice. So we... we in, in the role of yoga teachers, we do need to provide some kind of structure for people to follow. Um, so I think I've said my bit, really. Thanks. A gentleman in the orange that is both orange and bright. <laughs> orange is actually bright. Yeah, no, it was a really, really nice session and lots of new thoughts, new ideas for me to hear from such a beautiful, such an inspiring yogic panel up there. And I thought I'll add something, and hopefully that should answer a few more questions here too, especially about the authority. And I'm really grateful for the IYN, and especially Debbie somewhere, sort of doing all the hard work for bringing this event, this whole conference together. And to me, just the one little event from Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata reminds me, at the beginning of the Mahabharata, the whole epic, the whole war, where Arjuna and Duryodhana, they comes to Lord Krishna, his kingdom, to ask that can he take sides, can they help him? And amazingly, his elder brother, Balrama, he was a great, great soul too. And he said, look, I follow Ahimsa. I don't believe in war. I'm going to stay neutral. I'm not going to take either of the side. Now, you all know what happens at the end of the war. The guy, Duryodhana, the bad guy, he got this special blessing from his mother. He got this whole body, which is protected absolutely. Nothing can destroy, nothing can affect him. But the only little bits around his hips and pelvic area, as Krishna again tricked him, that he put some leaves on so his mother couldn't, play, couldn't bless him. So finally, then Arjuna, or the Bhima, one of the brother, he killed him by hitting him into those hips, those pelvic area. And in that moment, this elder brother comes in and he said, how can you kill my disciple in such a wrong, such a devil like preaching or breaking all the rules all the all the concepts or all the the righteousness you're teaching you're preaching to people and in that moment krishna asked him who are you to tell me this he said at the beginning when we had the choice to make that there is right there is wrong and in that moment there is no third choice of being neutral so thank you very much to creating this opportunity to giving us an idea hopefully we can, make, we can make a choice to see what is right and what is wrong from here. So please don't sit quietly. Let's talk, let's discuss, and let's take it forward. Do I have any questions for any of the other panelists? I'm going to be controversial on the other side, so I'm going to, I'm going to probably disappoint my teacher. I'm so sorry. So, um, I am not religious. I've been brought up in Portugal. I'm Catholic. So, first, since I was born, I'm a sinner. 
my mother, you know, is Eve and she ate the apple, so we've been in shame and we're going to go to hell and all this kind of stuff. What I discover with yoga is there is nothing like that. It's all about positive, it's about evolving. So um, I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, I'm starting as a new yoga teacher, so I've learned to play. I'm on my primary, you know, primary school, and I learned my asana. I'm now evolving, secondary school. I'm learning about your terms, I'm learning about science, I love science, and I can match and I can see good things. And then I'm evolving towards my secondary school and maybe my university. So I'm very grateful that I have teachings that come from a long time to help me with that guidance in good teachers. So my, and I learned as well one thing, it's not about the goal, it's not about if I can put my foot behind my head, which I can almost, <laughs> but it's about the process of being a better human being. So is me just sitting on the mat make me going to be a better human being or is it about me discovering myself, me discovering all the philosophy that has been with us for a long time, going to make me a better human being? And if that is the case, shouldn't we just you know, carry on doing it as it is? And if you just want to go to the mat, just call it something else and respect yoga. That's my question. Thank you. To any of you. Maybe I'll start a little. First of all, sitting on your mat is going to... Uh, be a moment where you pause, hopefully, where you arrive, where you're at. So there'll be a time-based uh, process. The central nervous system will hopefully start to settle. And maybe if one is very attentive to the inner workings of, of this wonderful being that we are, this human being, then maybe there will be a sense of revelation, of revealing oneself to oneself, and I suspect that's what Godfrey is uh, perhaps hinting at. This moment where sitting on the mat is making the, the time to go towards something, towards a moment where you are intentionally setting up a framework inside of which you can drop into another space, which is internalized, endosomatic. And so to, to that moment of, of uh, and I very much um, appreciate what um, Satish was saying about the internal and the external, and we always negotiate in that, that relationship and that field. How do we negotiate that? In is, initially, in terms of going to the mat, is just providing that moment where we move away from the demands of the ex inter external life and settle ourselves into something else which is very difficult to define in itself. Of course we have techniques. The technologies of yoga are wonderful and very, you know, and I, I think all of us here have proved that something of those technologies have actually influenced and affected our, our way of, our, our perception definitely of ourselves. <sighs> Uh, and the world, others, other people in the world at large. So I think that's a, that, that's a, maybe the first step to 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 enter into that space. And this is where the the human brain reorganizes itself. And maybe to witness that reorganization around the interiority that is so curious. And for me, that's that's what I call practice. I'll, maybe that's a start. You see, <clears throat> I think there is also another aspect of it because uh, <clears throat> once I had the possibility to meet, <clears throat> to meet uh, one of the disciples of, of uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj, and when we, meet, uh, when we met in, in Bombay, he said, okay, okay, no theories, please. Could you influence the way how you have been born? Where have you been born? To which parents have you been born? I said, no, okay, so why you worry? If this is all provided, then also the rest will be provided. So some pe people call it karma. If you have a sort of need for that, that means <clears throat> something in you uh, started moving, and uh, then it is, 
I would say even reasonable to rely on this. But I have to admit, when I was of your age, then I was also proactive. I have to do this, I have to do that, in this way, that way. Trying to find the best way how to do it. But it's not about doing. So this is, I think, a key, a key question. To accept all this, uh, <clears throat> what the life is giving to you, and realize that it's uh, really charting the way. Um, there is a model that you have a minimum maximum <clears throat> which you can achieve or through which minimum maximum you can uh, go through your life. And uh, at one cause, one friend raised his hand and said, you make me so unsettled with this min-max. Uh, and I said, why? Because I want to achieve samadhi and if it's not in my max, what to do? <laughs> so I said, just be quiet. If it's right, you will surely experience it. So. Don't worry, this is the main thing, just go on. And even though it's not always on the mat, but the whole life is a mat, uh, so just don't worry. <laughs> There's a famous Chinese saying, isn't it? Wise men have to sit for a long time with mouth open before roast duck fly in. <laughs> right. And I, I'm struck that we are, at the, we are at the tail end of over 65 million years of evolution to create an ecosystem in which this physical form could then actually manifest and uh, give us a vehicle for, uh, for continuing. We have a huge debt to act, because it's only by acting that we prevent stagnation in this incredible construct from setting in. Now, there is a, a thought I'd share with you which I think is pertinent to what you were saying, and the necessity for authority and the necessity for um, established paths to walk on. Um, in, in my mind, I have an image of a person trying to build a bridge as they're trying to cross it, which is great and probably exciting, and you'll learn an awful lot and experience lots of ups and downs. But if there are people who say, well, actually, we've learned how to create bridges already, and it would be better for you to stop your journey, reflect, learn how to create this bridge, and then create a bridge, you will get to the destination that you think you have to get to much, much faster. So it, take your pick. You have an infinite uh, life, uh, number of lives in front of you, and sooner or later you'll come to one point where you say, okay, enough of trying to build a bridge while I'm trying to cross it. You know, I've sort of dunked my head enough times now. Um, and so I, I would suggest that sitting on the mat is merely the first stumbling steps. We have to first learn how to become human before we then start to dismantle the actual construct which a human being is, body, mind, and disentangle. And that is not an easy journey. If I can share, if I have a moment, can I share one very specific incident which is so starkly embedded in my mind as an experience. I remember being in Nenital, which is in the foothills of the Himalayas. And I was there with my sons, and I experienced my first energy shift. And it was extraordinary. And so much so, there was so much energy coursing through this body that I could not handle it. But for a period of about six weeks, that energy convinced me that every woman I was encountering was madly in love with me. <laughs> right? I would look, and suddenly my brain would interpret it in a completely different way. There was so much energy going through. But I, but I was so grateful that I had had the preparation to recognize that this physical form the one that I was incarnated in, wasn't habitually associated with eliciting that sort of a response on a, a frequent basis. I think having grown up with four sisters as well, that was very firmly established. But it's because of the preparation that when that happened, I was able to navigate it without causing a complete and utter idiot of myself and without causing harm to other people. So there is a vast amount to be said for allowing yourself to follow where others have led. I know that there is a, an energy in the West which says, hey, sod that, I'm going to do my own thing. But there are some walls which cannot be stormed. They have to be gently knocked on the door, and then somebody will open a door to you, and then you will be allowed to go through, because it's in your interests and other people's interests. So yes, get on the mat, but be prepared, and take absolutely every bit of guidance you can from anybody and everyone who can offer you something which you then feel of value. There's a great deal of benefit in that way. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions from the floor? Gentleman over there with the light green T-shirt on. Hi. I do not have much yoga experience. I'm not a teacher. I go to a class once a week. 
Um, I have a question for Godfrey. Uh, you said go to the mat as a way to find this authority. Is that necessary, or could you find it in some other activity? And I have a second question, which came up afterwards. Um, it sounds like you might be saying the asana practice is a preparation, is a, is a prop that helps you into a meditative state, or as a, it is a prop toward meditation. Um, is that an accurate interpretation? Thank you. Briefly, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Um, when I um, posed my question, I said that it was going to be focused on the narrow fragment of yoga, of yoga posture practice. So my quick answer is, what I really meant was, go to your own intelligence. It's available. Let me just say one more thing. <laughs> and no matter what information you get your hands on, it's going to be processed through the intelligence that you are. So maybe you can rely on that rather than guessing which apparent external authority is the one. Swami? That's what I meant. Thank you. Swami? beautiful invitation and I think in the West it's an invitation that we just can get incredibly romanced by but Patanjali warns us Agamaha find your point of reference to just rely on oneself might be um, problematic because probably the most unreliable person we will ever meet is ourselves And so we have to make ourselves open and available to an external point of reference while we be discover that inner center that is the point of reference. That's all. Gentleman in the uh, <laughs> woolly face. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Godfrey's, uh, it seems to me, is extolling the virtues of... Um, relying on one's intelligence. I, I suspect that Satish is saying, well, um, there's a well-trodden path. Uh, why are you building a bridge and, and, and trying to cross it as you build it? Which I think these are two sort of almost opposing viewpoints. Um, uh, Swamiji, you, you, you're saying that the, uh, you know, you, there is this modern Western romanticism, beatnik romanticism, and I agree, it can be very shallow. But nevertheless, I, w I want to say that um, it's quite naive to imagine that, be that because we deceive ourselves, that people who appear to us to be authorities are not themselves self-deceived. Yeah. So actually, that uh, I think Godfrey's right. You know that you, if you're going to trust somebody with your soul, which is a pretty heavy thing to do. But that is problematic, just as it is problematic to trust oneself, given that human beings are almost incapable of not deceiving themselves. So I think our conundrum is a lot deeper than, than you're saying, you know. And, and um, Also, I'd say to Satish, you know, that the, the, the pathless land, I, I myself, I'm a pathless land waller. I think the bridge analogy is, is, is crap, because there is no path. There is no destination. There is no path. Right, so, but, but what I'm saying there is something that, that, that's pretty well consistent with a big strand in Sanskritic literature and Vajrayana literature and Devish literature. There is also a tradition, a deep and profound tradition of asserting there is no path, there is no path. Jump straight in. I agree, it's dangerous, you know. Your experience, I've seen people who've had an energy shift who weren't ready, um, and I get people phone me up about this out of the blue who don't know me from Adam, you know. So I'm not trying to um, downplay downplay all that, you know. But I think you can be challenged on on this representation of there are some kind of totally reliable gurus out there. It's a lot more pr problematic putting your, yourself in somebody else's hands than that. And please, be careful, always, in all ways. 
So, uh, 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 comment, my question there is, comment please. Can you comment please? All right. I think, Pete, it is paradoxical. Yeah. And, and we just have to accept that. And so, truth is a pathless land and there is no destination. And yet I'm walking a path towards a destination. It's just how it is. It's a paradox. And putting my trust in an external authority while I learn to walk is, again, I agree, there are many authorities or those claiming an authority out there who are dangerous. Uh, we've all encountered them. But um, my kids, one of them is here, my kids learn to walk from a bull terrier. <laughs> It used to stick its tail in the air, they'd grab its tail and off they'd go. Um, and that's problematic. This was, you know, we all know bull terriers are pretty dangerous dogs, especially for a toddler. But it worked. And so I think that that is the paradox. It's, we are learning to walk, we find a teacher. Once we can walk, we might have to move to the next teacher. If I can just add that we're having conversations with one person speaking to an awful lot of people, and there are going to people, there are going to be people for whom the words that I articulated and Swamiji's articulated and everybody else has articulated were the right words at the right time, and for others they will be totally the wrong words at a completely different time. And so, it's uh, please bear that in mind and don't go and try it at home. <laughs> as they say. Go for it. I would like to speak now on behalf of every single individual organization that has set themselves up as an authority and say that out there, there are many who have done the same, who are dangerous, but I am not one of them. <laughs> I'm just going to take one more question from the floor. Oh. Pardon me, I didn't see you there. Two more questions on the floor. Sorry. Uh, I, I did like that Satish started his, his uh, discourse with, with the quote of Buddha, saying, whatever I might say here, use your discernment to take it as a truth or to discard it. And I think that is the most viable teacher inside us all. And whether we are the novices on this path, the gym bunnies, I've got many of them, or the hardened old yogis, at every moment, with every breath of our life, we are making decisions. We are making discernments. And sometimes we make a decision that doesn't pay off or it hurts. And sometimes we make decisions that are great. And ultimately, whatever external authority we might be listening to, it's us who are concluding whether this is a nugget worth saving and whether it's productive for us to keep according to our own experience of what we have already grown into. So, sit on your mat. Yeah? I do my mat in bed with cat and dog. Yeah? Every morning. And in other circumstances, too. So, anyway, internal authority, I think. I'd just like to say that my remark at the beginning was actually just a legal disclaimer, but thank you so much <laughs> for adding authenticity to it. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to take two more questions, but they've got to be very, very brief, if you don't mind, because these two people have been waiting quite a, a substantial amount of time. Lady in the right. White. Right. Um, I wanted to go back to something that Pete Yates said earlier, which was neti neti, which is crucial to Hindu philosophy and theology generally. What it means is not this alone, not this alone. And... I think that applies very much here um, to it's not only our own experience and it's not only the external point of reference. It is not this alone, not this alone. It is both. 
Uh, the other thing is that uh, someone mentioned positivity, and this morning there was a discussion about not being negative. And my experience on my mat has been one of saying no and learning how to say no and seeing my own limitations in the sense that as you practice, you learn what you can do and what you can't do. That's part of, of practicing yoga on the mat. And then you work on that and you, you get a lot of instruction from that saying no. Also, uh, I would like to know what the panel think about the fact that yoga is in the world, which is what they were all talking about. And in the world, we have to say no to certain things. We have to say no to rivers of blood. We have to say no to people from Windrush being ripped off. We have to say no to abusive people in Syria, et cetera, et cetera. There are all kinds of things we have to say no to. So let's and that that. Is yo that's yoga also. So all of the speakers, in, as I heard them, were talking about yoga in the world. So I'd like to know what they think about saying no. No to NOS, for example. Could we keep it brief, if you don't mind? I would just like to, to, to say that we can never practice on a cloud. We, we're always practicing. Our practice is embedded in a political, economical, ecological context, cultural context, and that's always, always to... to, to we always have to, to have that in mind as well, not to separate ourselves from the, 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 the external life and to know that... <laughs> It has, an, uh, it has an effect on our practice, it has an effect on us, and, that, and our response has to have those uh, different layers to it as well. I, I believe it has a, a, an action to be done. It has to be revealed in action. And Bhagavad Gita says that to us. Consciousness is revealed in action. Thank you. If I can add just one thought, you see, instead of saying no, <clears throat> suggest a solution. We are called to vairagya, it means discernment. And in the process of discernment, we have to say no to certain things. And if I can say, every yoga thing I go to is overwhelmingly women, although very often you'll have overwhelmingly men talking to women. But, <laughs> and we need to correct that. Um, but women find no quite hard, and we don't want to be disliked. And so we tend to just kind of let this thing just ride through, you know. My female friends say to me, don't always put your head above the parapet, you know. You know it's going to be shot down. I don't mind. Um, so I think, I think Manisha is quite right. In the process of discernment, we have to say no to certain things. And the thing that we were considering here today was the process of the NOS. If it's something you think is needed, fight for it. If you think it's not and you want to say no to it, say it out loud. Stand up for that no. Thank you. Satish? Thank you. Um, great question. Um, the journey of a yoga practitioner, for me, can be summarized in the three lines of a mantra that many of us use, asatoma sat gamaya, tamasoma jyotir gamaya, mrityorma amritam gamaya. And the first line is asatoma sat gamaya, which is, allow me to see what is real. Now, that is uh, not possible um, without being able to have discernment and saying no to this and saying yes to this. A yogi, I feel, is a person who, or a, is an individual who can respond to the external circumstances without getting lost in this. It doesn't matter what it is, your response needs to be so clean, so straightforward, and so untrammeled um, with all of the... Uh, at this moment, there are people who are going around taking their own lives, sacrificing their own bodies because of ideas. They're taking the lives of other people because of ideas. And this is because they do not see the reality of their own existence. And we have to be able to see the reality and just respond to it without getting lost in that headiness. And a fundamental part of that means the simple ability to reject what is unnatural, what is violent, and what is going to increase suffering without getting lost in too much thought. So yes, very much a part of the journey. One word, Godfrey, have you got anything to say? No. <laughs> just, just say no to anything that you think is unjust. Um, do we have time for one more question from the floor? We don't. <laughs> Just before we go then, um, 
Can I just thank all of the panel for such an interesting um, session, I suppose. Um, if there was one message that you would give to all the yogis that are here, what would that be if you could put it into two words? Do you want to start, Giza? Absolutely, yes. <clears throat> two words? Yes. <laughs> Sama? Just trust your inner reference system. The last words of my guru to me, look before you leap, but for God's sake, leap. Uh, very simple, really. Fearless action. Discriminate as effectively as possible between information and the intelligence that's going to use that information. Thank you all very much for that. Uh, we're running over time. I'd like to hand over to Professor Peter Yates here. Is this one on? Okay, uh, what I'd intended to do is to try and summarise the main ideas very briefly that, uh, that, that have emerged in the, uh, uh, today. Um, I actually don't think I can do it, and I don't think I need to do it. I think it's uh, everything's standing for itself. I suppose w one thing I might say is that quite a big theme that, that's coming out is that people realise that they're embedded in a bigger world, yoga practitioners, and that seems to be uh, in the air, in the zeitgeist, you might say. Um, anyway, but uh, that, that's about it, really, as far as that part's concerned. But thanks, everybody, for turning up. The panellists, wonderful. I'm extremely excited and overstimulated <laughs> <laughs> now. Um, and I'm sure the, the rest of you are. And let's do something else, and let's... Let's uh, keep boogieing, you know, and uh, yes, we're, we're a broad church and it's fine. So thank you. And I'll, I think I'll thank everybody on behalf of everybody if you let me do that. <laughs> OK, I'm trying. Everybody at the IYN who worked so hard to put this together.